Hey there. So um, yesterday I had taken my daughter's car to the Toyota dealership to have uh, it serviced. And while I was there, it turned out it was a longer wait than I thought. They said it would take about two hours. It took about three and a half. No problem there. I got my book. So um, I am actually said I was starting off to read uh, Billy Bud Sailor, but it turns out this volume it contains several of um, uh, Herman Melville's writings, some of which I had not read before. Um, so I jumped in and I immediately read yesterday a very short story um, called The Piazza, which I didn't know what a piazza was. Again, this is by Herman Melville, a great author of um, the 19th century, um, author of Moby Dick, of course. Um, I bought the book for particularly to reread Billy Bud Sailor, but I'm happy to try other things as well. I love the 19th century romance writers, um, Hawthorne um, and, and Melville being two of my favorites. Um, the piazza, which I did, like I said, I didn't know what a piazza was. It's it's like a, a patio. Think of, think about that. I think that's Italian for piat patio. So here's how, here's the story, and it's not very long. It's probably what is it? It's 25 pages. Some, yeah, 20 pages, something like that. Not bad at all. Anyway, um, picture a perfectly placed setting. And part of the thing is, okay, I read authors like Melville for the story, of course. Um, but I often most enjoy them for the imagery, right? And the descriptive capabilities that he has of, of placing things. Now, Melville, of course, is one of those 19th century authors who is loaded with the classics in his mind. He's, he knows all the, all the classic Roman and Greek gods, all the mythology, etc. So he, he peppers his writing with that, and you have to constantly be looking it up if you're not already familiar, which I am not. So even if I was familiar, I forget quickly. So it's not part and parcel of my understanding. I don't have it in my, my toolkit. I wish I did, because so, much, so many of the writers that I enjoy reference uh, the classics. So anyway, so in this case, he's, he's setting up a, a, an interesting scenario. Um, utterly unfamiliar with the story. I knew nothing about it going in, as, as, as is my way of doing things. I don't even like to read introductions. I, I don't want anyone to cloud um, the, the story between me and the author. I like to know about the author's story. I like to know the author's history, like Thoreau said. You know, he feels better... Um, reading someone's writing if he knows how has a short biography of that person, uh, preferably from the person, from the author themselves. So I like that, but I don't like other people's descriptive elements, especially on some of these things like this is, I mean, the Penguin Classics is a great thing, but it's, you know, it's fine if they would just, I mean, it's, this writing is in the public domain. It's fine if they would just publish the writing. I, I have no problem with that, but a lot of these publishing houses feel obliged to put in some sort of an introductory professor so-and-so telling about their, their take on things. Sometimes you get, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's great, but sometimes, sometimes I, I gave this one a little bit of try, so I, I may read it after the fact or not at all. Anyway, I, I need to go quickly. My dogs are restless. I gave you guys a chance. I took them. I went downstairs and to feed them and walk them, but they didn't want to come. Now, now I come back upstairs and now they want to go. So the piazza. So picture this. Picture in the countryside. Picture a perfect setting. So you buy a piece of land. The story revolves around a man and a woman, but, but initially a man. And he's bought a particular house that just so happens to be perfectly situated on a piece of land that, as he describes, and this is where you have to reach down sometimes and, uh, and, des and describe things, um, he describes it as though the, the gods had just, you know, you know, selected a spot. But that's, as he said, the sword of sort of Damocles. I just saw it, um, which I didn't know. I'd heard of the sword of Damocles, but I didn't actually know what it was. Oh, here it is. Here it is. He's, he says, "Whoever built the house, he buildeth better than he knew, or else Orion in the zenith flashed down his Damocles sword, Damocles' sword to him some starry night, and said, build there." For how otherwise could it have entered the builder's mind that upon the clearing being made, such a purple prospect would be his, nothing less than Greylock, with all his hills about him, like Charlemagne among his peers. So lots of references here. You, you have to dig. This is writerly writing. You have to dig. You have to participate to understand. I mean, of course, let me just go into, you know, Orion, you know, Orion in his zenith, the, the, the constellation Orion in his zenith flashed down his Damocles sword, you know, and I didn't know, I didn't know 
what the Damocles sword was. I had to look it up. I mean, I'd heard of it, but the Sword of Damocles references to the story, I think it's a Greek story, maybe a Roman story, of um, uh, the king and his servant, uh, and his servant remarking about how what, what a wonderful thing it must be to be the king, and the servant, and the king says, well, how about we trade places tomorrow? You be the king and I'll be the servant. And he said, okay, that sounds great. Now, and so the next day he's, they trade places, the servant, now in the place of the king, is enjoying all the the, the luxurious couch, the, 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 the fruit, the, the wines, the, 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 the beautiful servants, the luxuries, all of it's great. You know, everything he'd hoped for, power, adulation, except the king, Damocles, has taken a sword and hung it above the, the, the throne, point down, and it's hanging by a horse's hair, single horse's hair. And so he's sitting there, the, the servant is sitting there acting as king, enjoying all of this splendor, knowing that there's a sword directly above his head that could snap the horse's hair at any time and fall right on his head and, and take him out. The message being that he was, Damocles, King Damocles was trying to express to the servant was, yeah, all of this great, is, all these riches are great, but it comes at a price. The price is that, that you make enemies, uh, you're not always liked, um, your position is in danger of faltering at any time. And here, um, uh, Melville uses the sword of Damocles not as an, uh, an auspicious symbol of, uh, of wisdom, you know, of leading to wisdom, but recognizing doom, potential doom, but as Orion shining down right there, right here, that's the spot to build. So beautiful. I mean, in a single sentence, to, to load all of that into a single sentence. No wonder I love the 19th century remote romance writers, right? But it takes a lot of work. So one more time, whoever built the house, he built it better than he, better than he knew. Or else Orion in the zenith flashed down his Damocles' sword to him some starry night and said, build there, there. So, and then it goes on, and for how otherwise could he have entered, could it have entered the builder's mind that upon the clearing being made, such a purple prospect, I think the purple is a reference to, to, to the, the purple of the Roman royalty, right? Only the, only, the, only the emperor and his family could wear purple in ancient Rome. Purple prospect would be, would be his, nothing less than Greylock, which is a reference to a mountain, which then... Uh, Melville references to King Charlemagne, who is referenced several times in here, I mean, he even says so, with all his hills about him, like Charlemagne among his peers. So imagine a perfect little spot just situated so that even the gods are shining upon them, you know, they beckoning, build here. And if you do, you're going to have this perfect prospective views of all around you, north, south, east, and west, namely to the north, great Charlemagne, great Greylock the mountain, and, and then the lesser mountains all about. So, I mean, just setting the stage for this. So the man had bought the property, he's got the house, it's, it seems to be perfectly positioned, it's up on, the, it's up on a hill above the town, um, but, but it's lacking one thing. It, it doesn't have a, a patio, a piazza, a place from which he can enjoy the scenery around him. But now he's got a problem, he wants to build one, but his, his funds are a little limited. He can't build a 360 degree piazza around the house to enjoy at all the different seasons, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the north side for winter, I mean, for summer to get out to get, get a little a little shade and a little rest from the heat and to enjoy the beautiful view of the mountains and then in the winter time the the sunny south side where he can um, look out over the town below and he describes here elsewhere the the east and the west and being able to see the, the fields down below the fields of grain and he talks about the watching the winds come through like billows come here sweetie now you went out i took him down he did come downstairs after a while and i fed him and uh, he went out and did his business. So I know you're in good shape. You just want a little papa time, huh? <laughs> all right. So he talked talk, talk about all four compass cord, you know, all cardinal sides of the house have their advantages for a piazza. But which side to choose? Which side to choose? And he talks about how he chose um, the north side, and that the builders that came up were, you know, you know, uh, you know, kind of laughing at the fact that he had done that. I forget where this is situated. I think it's not. I think it's in, I don't know, it's somewhere in Europe. And anyway, they're laughing because who would want to sit on the north side of the house in the winter outside, chilling in, in, in the freezing day to, for, for, for what purpose? What an idiot, right? But he describes how he's got there's some real benefits to it. And he goes on and read the book to get the benefits. Great writing, really good writing. In fact, I, I noted a couple of here, the bits in yellow here, that are just fantastic 
fantastic writing. Just a little bit, let me just give you a little bit, describing the, the waving grains. <clears throat> He's describing his, the choice, the fact that the choice, he chose the northern part of the house for the piazza, the benefit. He says, in summer too, canut light, like sitting here. So canut, um, I forgot. I forgot. I looked it up and now I forgot. It's, it's interesting, another, another literary reference. In summer too, Canute like sitting here, one is often reminded of the sea. For not only do long ground swells roll the slanting grain, and little wavelets of the grass ripple over upon the low piazza as their beach. It's like he's sitting on a beach, right? And he's got the grass, the down below the grains in the valley, and he's watching the way the winds blow through like waves upon the sea, and then coming all the way up the hills to the grasses that come right up to the piazza, like ripples on the, on the, on the beach, like he's sitting on a beach. And the blown down of dandelions is wafted like the spray, so then the, the dandelion's tuft is, is come up to him like sea spray. And the purple of the mountains is just the purple of the billows, and the still August noon broods upon the deep meadows as a calm upon the line. The line, I think, in reference to the to the, the the ships of the line, right? The the great the great uh, warships that might be uh, laying at anchor. But the vastness and the lonesomeness are so oceanic, and the silence and the sameness too, that the first peep of a strange house rising beyond the trees is for all the world like spying on the Barbary Coast, an unknown sail. They're talking about sitting in his little, now the piazza's done, the northern light. He's able to sit there. He's talking about in the summer, a little bit secluded, able to watch the, the, way, the winds playing upon the grain below, coming up, bringing the dandelion whiffs, and seeing the distant houses, the play of light happens. And he loves to talk about purple. The play of light happens in spotting a house in the distance, similar to a pirate scene, a, 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 a sail on the Barbary Coast in the seas. Couldn't you just imagine? That's just a sample of the great writer that Herman Melville is. Tremendous. If you haven't read Moby Dick, I highly recommend it. Um, read, Bar read um, uh, maybe Bartle start with Bartleby the Scrivener, then go to Billy Bud Sailor, and then you'll be ready to take on the great uh, white whale himself. Anyway, so that now he's got his, he's got his house. He's got his piazza, and he's talking about sitting out there on a, on a winter's day and watching the play of light upon the mountains about the great gray lock, you know, the reference to Charlemagne, the great mountain. And he talks about how at a particular time of day, there's this kind of a slant of light that comes down, and it reveals kind of like a twinkle, a tinkle, something up on the, high up on the mountains. He doesn't quite know what it is. He thinks it might be an old abandoned mill, maybe a structure of, of some sort, <clears throat> but he's knowing noting recurrence of that, that twinkle, that light is appearing uh, day in and day out. So, he's, so there's something up there and he's wondering, what is it? Why is it? It seems to be new, like as if the, the rains had, had uh, left a, a, a spray upon, left their, their residue upon the uh, rooftops and that he's seen that, or maybe windows or whatever. And he's just wondering until one day he decides he's got to find out. So he makes his way, um, gets in a small vessel, goes across a mountain tarn, a lake, to the far side up against where it butts up against the mountains and then slowly makes his way up the mountain to indeed discover an old mill. The one side of the roof has been freshly uh, uh, redone. That's what's giving the glean, right? It's the new, new, the new surface. And then again, the rain causes the moisture. Now here's where the story gets interesting. He, well, it's been interesting all along, but here's where it gets some um, human, human element comes in. He steps to the door and notices a young woman inside at her, as he calls it, at her woman's work, her, her dull woman's work, right? And that, that plays a factor in this, right? The, the dullness, the fact of it's women's work. Um, and she, she's knit, she's, I think she's um, uh, sewing or knitting or something. And uh, he says something and she, oh, starts and kind of, and the way he describes the way she starts is interesting, not fear, not anxiety, but kind of a fatigue, kind of a, a world weariness, right? Oh, oh, you know, she's not afraid of him, but in fact, she moves about and prepares a chair and beckons him to come inside and, they, and sit. And in, she goes immediately back to her work, not looking up, not gazing out the window, nothing. And they have a conversation. And what comes out of the conversation, and by, if I haven't said this already, spoilers, I'm going to spoil this whole story as I always do with my book reviews. So if you want to read it yourself, then probably read no further. I haven't really given too much away yet, but I will from this point forward. 
um, at this point, she describes, he's describing, he's, he's, he's kind of flabbergasted, like he's blown away, right? Because this is what he had dreamed, right? He had dreamed that maybe this was some secreted fairyland up in the mountains where there may be a fairy living. You know, this is just, and fairies were popular things in the 19th century. Um, uh, just think of uh, Sir, Carth, Sir um, Co Arthur Conan Doyle and uh, his, his distraction with fairies. Um, but... Um, here he seems to have found a fairy secluded place and a fairy, nothing less than a fairy herself at her, at her work. A little inquiry learned that she's not alone. She has a brother, a younger brother, and uh, he's out. He comes sometimes goes away to do his men's work out in the forest. He'll be gone for a day, sometimes a night, and he'll come back. And he doesn't stay long, but when he does, he comes back. And it's a hard life. The two of them, the brother and sister, came to the mountains some time back, and the brother was the one that had repaired the roof and made the house habitable. Um, and she stays day in and day out, mostly alone, mostly at her work, the drudgery, the toil, very rarely going out, walking a little bit in the, in, in the woods. He asks her, do you ever go out? And she said, once in a while I'll go out, but for the most part I come back and I stay indoors. I have one thing, I can look out this one window here, and I can see down in the valley below, and I see what appears to be a castle, a castle down there, far in the valley. I can see the, the gleam of the, of the light, the purple even, again the purple. He, remember, he witnesses the purple on the mountain. Now she's witnessing the purple down below, purple being symbolic of royalty, of emperor, of emperor right? She sees that and she wonders, it occupies her mind. What, what is that place? What is that castle? Who, who could be living there? And he doesn't even, she doesn't even look up. She continues just at her knitting. I think that's what she was doing, knitting, all the while describing this. And he wonders how he's able to describe to her things, but he's, that is, she's not even looking at it. He kind of looks out the window and gains kind of a view. And suddenly it dawns on him. She's been looking at his house down on the valley. And he's been looking at her house up on the mountain. And each of them has been witnessing the gleam of light, the purple no less. And she imagines that his place is a castle because he said, looking at my home from afar, it does indeed look like it's made of stone and it could be mistaken for a castle. And he'd mistaken her place for a fairy's fortress, <laughs> right? And then she and he, he thought it would be occupied by fairies and she would think it would be occupied by a, by a king. Neither of them really were aware that, that it was just, or he was now, that it's just regular old habitations occupied by regular old people. Uh, mistaken is a better for the, uh, for the distance and the gulf of, 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 of change, not just in distance, but in latitude, I mean, in, in, in altitude as well, right? Being the, the higher, rarer air of the, of the, the mountain cabin and the, and the cos more cosmopolitan, warm, uh, in, uh, you know, life-filled area down below, not far from the, the rippling, uh, you know, the, 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 the waterfalls and the, the little mountain tarns, and et cetera, and, and et cetera. So each of them is, this is something we all do, right? We all, we all long for um, a better world, a better life somewhere else, someplace else. And he suddenly realizes that, that, that she had been under the same spell and illusion that he had been. And she describes how she would dream that someday she would go down and see who lived there. Now the story just kind of unwinds and finishes it at that point. Um, I'll leave it to you to, to, to read and get all the details. The beautiful writing, the imagery, the incredible vocabulary, and the reference to, to the past and to beautiful um, traditions of both Roman and Greek uh, history and uh, mythology. It's a very good story, especially the more I think about it the more I realize how, how much Melville was talking about all of us. The Piazza by Herman Melville. Highly recommend it. Take care. And you, and you, shall we go back downstairs and go for a walk? Let's do that.